Hi, my name is Jeff Adams. I'm with Terra Sophia, an ecological design and watershed restoration company uh, based in Moab, Utah, and I'm here to share a project that I worked on with the Kavira Coalition down in northern New Mexico um, in a place called the Vivadal of the Carson National Forest. It's a uh, slope wetlands restoration project, and so really trying to plug um, some of these head cuts so that the water can spread out better across the uh, entirety of the valley. And so here we've got two locations where water has started to channelize and is head cutting and dropping, um, creating a, a scar in the landscape, but also draining what we could think of is the bathtub of this slope wetland through that, that down cutting process. Where the um, water really should be wet from one edge of the valley to the next. And as these head cuts progress, they cause localized draw drying. So one of the goals of this particular project was to both stop the further erosion of this um, headwater ecosystem and also see what we can do to spread that water back out so that the more uh, greater width of valley remains saturated. Um, so this was the the before picture and um, we had uh, part of the Kavira model is to have um, have workshops and uh, one of them included uh, fixing up this. So here we are in progress treating those two different um, head cuts and also bringing the the um, water back together so you can see there's that water that's coming around here and then there's that other flow that's coming coming down this side and these structures with the logs are called log drop structures or sometimes they're called log and fabric step fall and that's because there is some filter fabric on the upstream edge of these about where this gentleman in the boots um, is standing and that prevents the water from piping through and between the logs and causes it to come up to the surface and flow over the top. And the step falls part of it is really creating that staircase so that the water loses its erosivity as it falls from one hardened surface to the next, gets all the way down to the, um, the base grade and then can continue to go on its way. Um, we used to also used a combination of rock armoring and these techniques go really well together because you can the the bulk of your structure built with logs and those can either be site harvested if you have trees available or um, imported from a, a timber operation and then the rocks allow you to fill in all the edges and fill in on uh, and armor some of the the areas that are hard to get with logs um, and, and particularly in this case, we kind of have this broader slump face in there that would have taken a lot of logs, but we were able to just cobble line it with some of these, um, these rocks and create a stable situation that then these wetland grasses can grow up through and in between the rocks. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's it in progress. And then um, here it is completed. And you'll notice that in, in this project, we also got a log mat and I'll point to that in just a second. So here we've got the water flowing this way and at the bottom of the screen is, is this log mat. It's very similar to a one rock dam. It's used to control the grade in the channel and that these the, the tops of these logs are high enough that water would back up to the bottom of these logs. And so that inundated area when in a, in a flow event would be this whole spot in there. And what that does is that further helps to buffer any erosivity of, of that falling water. So the water comes down, it goes one log, two logs, another, and then it hits then it hits a splash pool. So it's got all these opportunities to lose energy, drop any sediment that might be in the water and have more of it soak in. And 
I would expect in this particular project, given that it's a high elevation, about 10,000 feet wet meadow system, we'll be getting really good vegetative response as, um, as a lot of this existing vegetation starts to grow in and colonize the increased wetted area that we've helped to create. Jeff, this is phenomenal. You're, you're coming to a site, you're coming to a, a different state, you're coming with the same toolbox of low tech erosion control, but specifically about the context of this site, you're seeing this, this wetland and there's channelization, there's a little drop and over time it's head cut. And you're coming with this toolbox with your mind as a, you know, call it a watershed craftsperson. And you're able to slow and spread this water with the materials you have to the point to where would it be fair to say within five to 10 years, we may not even see these structures anymore? Yeah, I think that that's definitely fair to say. We've got um, some that are, yeah, three, four, five years old and, and they're getting very well vegetated. Um, some of the spots where the logs are two to three high and some of the overlaps, those areas are the slowest to reveg because just because there's a, a lack of soil there because it's mostly the logs stacked on each other, but all of the, the edges and the places where the logs are right on in contact with the ground, um, those are, are really good spots to get some pretty rapid revegetation, especially in a wet system like this. It's, um, you know, it's New Mexico, so the state is dry, but being up in the mountains um, gives this structure an advantage from a revegetation standpoint, and we'll get quicker response here than we would in say Moab, Utah, where, where I live, structures are just slower to revegetate because water availability is lower. And if this was a conservation situation or if this was a production situation with animals, this is the other part that's so brilliant about this. You can have uh, ruminants, you can have ungulates, you can have bovidae, you know, cows and deers that are walking over this. And again, this isn't fence, this isn't um, concrete or rebar. These are materials that these animals know how to work around, they know how to walk through. And we've taken a dangerous situation. We just created uh, uh, an implementation where all of these animals, us included, can work through this area. And eventually this will go back to this wetland meadow. Yes, absolutely. So this area again is in the Carson National Forest and there are, this is one of the prize elk hunting parts of New Mexico and it is also grazed with, with cows. So there is heavy animal pressure in this area and that's part of why the, um, the rock armoring and these like physical structures are so important to stabilize things so that they can handle some level of hoof shear, some level of, of grazing and or herbivory and um, actually it in also increases the value of the forage. Some of the wetland species, especially the carex, have a much higher um, nutrient content when foraged compared to some of the upland grasses that have started to come into these systems as they dehydrate through these degradation processes, the vegetation changes to actually less desirable forage for wildlife and uh, livestock. So we're also helping to just improve um, forage content in these areas. So again, low tech erosion controls for ranchers, for conservationists, for individuals that are working on homesteads or land managers where we're seeing erosive potential but forage is a, is a high priority. These are easy to understand, easy to learn, easy to implement structures that can scale for any budget. As you've said a number of time, are shovel ready. And folks can learn in a short amount of time and actually start practicing. This is what I love about the work that you and Neil Bertrando do is you can work with these structures, you can learn with these structures and you can scale up the structure as your capacity scales up. So as you become more confident, the structures can get a little bit more larger. Whereas with other earthwork structures, you really have to know everything about everything before you start. But with these, even the work scales with you. Yeah, it's true. There's, um, there's a lot of structures that look just like this that we built with, with machines that have bigger rocks and bigger logs, but are the same 
same overall pattern. So we can do um, build it by hand. It fits um, building and, and using machinery when that's available and when the, the scale suits it. And uh, yeah, once the once the base principles are understood and some of the the channel geometry is understood, then um, it's really time to to get out there and start starting small and growing and um, putting this into practice. Brilliant, Jeff. Brilliant. Any any other final notes about this project or about the process of learning about low tech erosion control? Um, yeah, good questions. I would just add that this particular project is also very much about enhancing um, cold water fisheries. So this is um, a tributary to Comanche Creek, uh, which is a tributary to Rio Costilla, both of which are um, are prized trout fishing lands. And so as part of the strategy of restoring the creek is also to restore these head, headwaters to both take some of the stormwater and snowmelt flow, get them to move slowly through the groundwater system where the water stays cleaner and cooler rather than having it rush off faster, potentially contribute to higher flows or flash flooding, but also be a bit warmer and a bit more and more sediment by going over these erosive areas. So we're, we're accomplishing a lot for um, fisheries too, even though this itself isn't actually a, you know, with fish in it. It's just part of the, the watershed in the system. Um, in terms of like how to get going in this, um, I think Neil and I both have fairly similar paths of like starting in, in landscaping, but then getting into erosion control and watershed restoration through um, different collaborations and a lot through um, the Kavira Coalition has has workshops, you know, hands-on kind of go camp out and, and get involved in some of this work. And so it's been a, a journey of seeking out the people that are doing it, getting out on projects and then, and then just doing it and innovating. And I feel like almost every project we innovate and tweak and, and put the materials together in a slightly different pattern following similar principles, but we've really gotten to the point of like, how do we fit our materials to the shape of the land rather than trying to change the shape of the land to fit the materials we want to use? And that's helped us to minimize how much um, kind of squaring off or cutting out of the head cuts to make things fit the knee. Instead, we just work with the curvature and the bumpiness of the land and um, make our materials fit into that. And it's an incredible viewpoint and an incredible perspective, Jeff. And I'm just so, so pleased that you're bringing this to a wider audience with the upcoming low tech erosion control course with Neil Bertrando in 2022 through regenerativeliving.com. If folks are interested to learn more about Jeff, you can go to terrasofia.com. And if you're interested in this upcoming course, go to regenerativeliving.com and check out low tech erosion control. It's going to be a seven session course where Neil and Jeff both experienced hands at this are going to go through the process of learning how to do this work, how to assess this work, how to put it into action, and how to actually try it yourself. Thanks again, Jeff.